We here at Artsy Window had the pleasure of visiting a dope space called Flower Shop Collective. Flower Shop Collective is an art and fabrication studio that cultivates the ideas of emerging artists working towards more equitable futures. Their goal is to help artists of all skill levels execute their ideas, learn new techniques, and have a safe space to do so, with a prioritization on immigrant artists, artists of color, and women identifying artists. También les ofrecen todos estos servicios en español. For more information, head to flowershopcollective.com or flowershopcollective on Instagram. Go check them out. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of AW Classroom Podcast. Today, we are joined by four artists that are part of the Cocinando Artsy Window virtual exhibition. And I'm so honored to be sharing space with y'all, Cielo, El, Nicole, Emmanuel. Today, we're gonna be talking about the themes that are within the exhibition. We're gonna be talking about food, family, home, our roots, our culture, and also how all of these themes are in the works and how all of the artists have touched on these topics and more. We're going to be talking about our favorite food. We're going to be talking about all the things. We're just going to start off with a little intro from everybody. I'm going to start off with myself. Hi, my name is Giara Cristina Ventura, and I'm the founder of Artsy Window. Uh, I'm Estelle mm-hmm. Masonette. Uh, I'm one of the artists in the show. I'm a multi- uh, interdisciplinary mixed media artist. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Nicole Bello. I'm also one of the artists in the show and I'm a visual artist. My name is Emmanuel Marcio. I'm a conceptual artist based in New York on the DPM artist in the show. Oh, I'm Cielo Felix Hernandez, another artist in the show and I'm a sculptor and a painter. Just to give everyone a little bit of like foundation about your work, what mediums do you work with? And yeah, how would you just describe yourself as an artist? Um, I work primarily in oil paint and satin. I describe myself as more of like a transdisciplinary artist. I'm definitely exploring and trying to push these materials, um, but also combine them to make something that is moves past art. My work is a mixture of many things, mostly because I can't pick one thing I like. (laughs) It's a mixture of painting, uh, printmaking, um, sculpture, and photography, and really combining all of those things to create spaces that feel like the spaces that I occupy or experience and navigate. My works use uh, clothing I collect from people, uh, but they're void of the human body. And part of that is questioning how uh, figure, object, and place kind of allude to identity or misconceptions or preconceived identities. And just like, how does that happen? How does that allude to like economic status or sexual orientation or gender? And how does that shift from viewer to viewer? So it's really like a way to have either communal or self-reflection about how we do those things. I would describe myself as a as like a big child because I feel like a lot of my work is based in exploration. I'm so attracted to materials. I'm never going in trying to create a specific identity or specific image. Um, it's more just kind of playing around and being excited about a textile or being excited about an object I found. And I feel like that's what makes it fun for me. I would say that I paint mostly in oil paint. However, um, I do experiment with oil pastel and acrylic as well as fabric. My work is heavily rooted in like feminine energy. Um, My pieces now have me as the center, um, as the protagonist. Before it was just like different female. A lot of it, I touch on memories, culture, sensuality, issues that, you know, uh, as females, we go through. Um, that I've been through, that I hear like my mother, my sister-in-law, my grandmother, right? They've gone through. I try to put that into my paintings as a way to convey a story or just kind of just touch roots on like the things that have been overlooked, right? Within my culture. Yes, my work, um, my work, I kind of um, explore um, 
I'm very much inspired by my culture in the inner city of Washington, D.C. And as it relates to like African culture, uh, like African kind of like sculpture, uh, traditions, uh, Spanish, like food. And I'm very much interested in like about like language because my first uh, my first language is Haitian Creole. I was very much uh, inspired by how that language was created through like oppression and the need of like trying to communicate uh, from slaves trying to communicate with each other. Um, so like the slave fans didn't understand. So how that language created out of oppression and kind of like moving kind of ideology of inner city language and kind of how that language is used from oppression and kind of exploring that through my work. I kind of dabbled through a couple of mediums, paint, photography, and a sculpture. And my sculpture are primarily used like found objects and wood, paying homage to the long lineage of like assemblage artists of African American descent from like the South. I'm finding like these kind of wood pieces from my area and kind of fusing them together to kind of like give it its own spirit. I love that. So oh, my second question is. What's your favorite food or a food that, or a dish that reminds you of home? Uh, I, I can answer that. Um, uh, so I'm from Haitian. So we have this food, it's called a de blanc avec sauce So basically it's like white rice with like bean soup. And so that's a the traditional dish I ate growing up. And it just reminds me of home. Like I'm, I think about it now, I kind of think about my grandma being in the kitchen. And you know, we were just speaking our native tongue and just watching something on TV and noise like a meal where like a lot of my family gathered and ate. And you know, uh, I think food and I think with this exhibition is important because a lot of food and like the Latinx community, it brings us together. Like, you know, uh, I think a lot of our cultures, we go through so much struggle, even through like Haiti right now going through the earthquake. But I know like, Food will always bring people together and food kind of has this sense of happiness and then kind of like the elders who cook the food, you know what I'm saying? Just no matter what we go through as people, we always have like food to find you know. I also love that that's like a way we show like love to each other or like care. Like my dad, like no matter what, it's like, he's just like, oh, I have food. Like I made food or like, <laughs> and it's like, you have to eat. Like anytime we go to your family's house, it's like, if you don't eat, it's like, disrespectful it's like <laughs> don't care if you're hung if you're not hungry it's like you need to have some my favorite food uh, is so hard because there's so many good ones but I mean obviously in the piece right that's been it's like that is such a, a tradition right any holiday that's the meal we're wait, cooking wait wait wait, wait. that me in your uh -huh. piece it looks so good like it looks real <laughs> if I I'm can just so reach hungry. inside of it <laughs> and I'm vegan <laughs> I was so hungry just making it. I was like, I felt like I was making a real penny in there. I was like, girl, if only, if only, if only. Um, but I think what I love about pernil is that it, it always like marks the celebration, right? It's it's not really a meal you would cook on a basic Monday. I mean, if you did, everyone would be hyped, but it's more like a Christmas, Thanksgiving, birthday kind of celebration. Um, and I like that that like food kind of memorializes that and just the preparation and work going into it. But you know, pasteles, mofongo, I could go on. <laughs> All right, so um, ditto with Estelle because um, my mom takes such joy in me eating. Like I'll literally be eating and she'll just be sitting there smiling at me. She'll just be like, and I'm like, ¿Tú está bien, ma? And she's just like, sí, mi hija, come, come, quiere, ma? So it's like the funniest thing because I'm just like, oh my goodness. Um, but for me, my favorite is arroz con habichuela, pollo guisado, y plátano maduro, right? And it's like such a basic dish, but it's like comfort. It's nostalgia, right? Wait, it's can like, you translate that for no for the people? Oh, sorry, don't sorry. So it's chicken, <laughs> right? So it's like it's uh, what do we chicken stew? right? Pollo guisado. Yeah. So it's like chicken stew, rice, and beans with um, sweet plantain. My mom does what's called arepita de yuca, which is like uh, yuca fritters or cassava, right? Cassava fritters. 
Um, so she literally like takes the the cassava or the yuca, she peels it, she gets a grater, and then she grates it by hand. And if anyone has ever peeled a yuca, it is the most difficult, literally, like for me at least. Like it's the most difficult crop to peel because it's so hard. Like the skin is so hard on that yuca. And um, she takes it, she bakes, she puts egg in it, right? She puts um like little um anise, like anise, and then she like gets like this hot hot pan, puts oil in it, and then she puts it in there. And that combination is the best. It's just like so literally like I just feel so much love in that dish. Um, here in Dominican Republic, they call they like the, the chicken, they'll get like fresh chicken from outside from like a chicken coop. Um, so they call it criollo, right? So it's Creole. So it's literally like right from your backyard. This is different, honestly. And like everything, the seasoning, the cilantro, the peppers, everything that they use, um, that and the, obviously the love. Hold up. <laughs> you guys call it cassava? <laughs> no. Wait, we now. call it we call it yuca, but I feel like there's some people that call it cassava. No, I'm we call never... it yuca. Okay, okay. Wait, what's it called in English? Because I literally have no clue. It's that. It's cassava. It's yuca. Am I wrong? It's cassava. I, I don't know. I didn't even know. Someone help. Someone help us. <laughs> I had no idea what. All cassava right, I, is. I'm I'm chiming like, in. What are you guys deciphering? Yeah. What are you guys so deciphering? How do you say yuca in English? I thought it was cassava. Yuka. <laughs> I think it's the same name. So I think the technical root name is cassava. Yeah. I'm telling you because I work with, you know, I got to, sometimes like I'll talk, you know, I'll be like, like just now, Kiara was like, can you translate? And I'll be like, oh, oh yeah, my bad. Uh, let me find the word. <laughs> like, you know, so <laughs> thank you, Miguelina. I'm pretty, right. it's the same thing though, right? It is. It's, yeah. the okay, okay. it's the same thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. Thank it's you. Just Thank you, Mom. In English. Um, You're welcome. Just, just, just a reminder if we need any help, if we need a phone line to call someone, we would, we'll get my mom on it for the podcast. Thank you. Any anyway, friend? Oh, yes. I have a job. Dial a mom. Dial a mom. Dial a mom. Oh my God, that sounds cute. <laughs> Dial a mom. Love it. Cielo, what's your favorite food? Um, shit, I was thinking about it this whole time, and I, I, was, I was just getting really hungry, y'all. Um, but I, I would say, like, alcapurria, because I feel like nobody makes them as good as, like, my aunt, and I feel like alcapurrias, by the way, are, like, a combination of, like, yuca, which was, which what we were talking about, and green plantains and so but then that's just like the base of it right and then you have like the meat and then the meat is what really you know sells it to me um but I think the process of doing it and folding it um in a banana leaf sometimes um is like really beautiful because then you're just like wrapping it up it's very similar to like tamales I'd say like if we were to like think about like foods and how foods are like in dialogue with like different you know foods from a different you know geographic perspective you know I feel like there's so many different overlaps like and I just think that that's really beautiful but I've been craving those hella and that's something I can't ever give like you know what I mean I can't go anywhere here and have like the same thing, especially because it's the, like it's just something that when I go back to Puerto Rico, like you would get at um como se llama um Luisa, and it's like you won't get it anywhere else. Like it's like a specific spot, and I feel like my our favorite foods are rarities almost, but also like comforting because it kind of re reconnect us to our lands in a lot of ways and. I don't know, even hearing you guys share your favorite foods, it seems like really grounding, so. In connection like to the exhibition, when I was coming up with the theme, I was thinking of the kitchen. And that's how I came up with the name for the show, like Cocinando, because I was relating kitchen space to the artist studio. I'm relating the kitchen to the artist studio space because the same way that we would experiment in the kitchen, 
we experiment or y'all experiment in the artist studio. So my question is, um, what are you experimenting slash or processing when you're in your space, when you're painting or sculpting? Um, like, what are you processing in your work? Uh, just recently, I discovered a new body of work. I had kind of stepped away from sculpture, but kind of took the aspects of my sculpture into painting. So I started making these large scale dog food paintings and uh, painting uh, made out of sunflower seeds. And when I was uh, thinking about like this new process, I was very much inspired by like uh, growing up in like the inner city and experiencing uh, people that were going in my school. I, like we were like in, in a food desert, so there wasn't easy access to like home cooked meals uh, because either, you know, family structures were like, you know, um, single mothers, they had to rush to send the kids to school. The only thing they probably, oh, here's a couple of dollars, go get something from the corner store. And there wouldn't be literally for miles a place to get like a fresh home cooked breakfast or meal uh, before or after school. So it probably wasn't until they got back home, they really got to eat something real. So I, I've seen a lot of people eat like actual sunflower seeds for breakfast. Um, and it was just kind of crazy to me growing up when I kind of left DC, I kind of realized like, yo, this, this isn't normal. But when I was there, it was like, this is a normal thing. And, uh, me being like Haitian, uh, we was always a big emphasis on much food, new, you know what I'm saying? Like just eat, 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 you know what I'm saying? Uh, and a lot of people didn't kind of have that cultural background of like people, their family making sure they ate fresh, like produce and stuff like that. So I kind of started experimenting with like uh, the sunflower seeds and also like the, the dog food. Uh, Cause me, like, I'm from the inner city of DC. So dog food is like a slang term for like heroin because heroin is raw form, looks like dog food. Uh, so kind of set this weird connection of this food and this material, connecting it to the civil rights movement, for like protests or kind of like police officers were feeding black people two dogs um, and just trying to mix these materials up and trying to kind of talk about my experience with those materials. And the experimentation part like you were talking about was trying to figure out how to get these materials to stick to the canvas. Cause as an artist sometimes we have these crazy ideas but we also have to experiment on smaller pieces to make sure the bigger pieces it could work, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it seems like you're speaking a lot about um, consumption, but in the different ways that we can consume, even outside of, you know, eating, you know, drugs, um, you know, what kind of music we listen to, or, you know, the environment that we're around, like we consume it every day because it's our lived experience. Um, also, I have a question, is that dog, is like, is the painting behind you made of dog yeah. food? Wow. Wow. It, it smells really bad in here. It smells like <laughs> and, you know, I have a little dog cashmere in here. So Aww. the dog we have in our studio, he's going crazy right now. He's just trying Aww. to claw at it. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else want to speak about um what they're processing in their work? Um, Emmanuel, also, I would mix those sunflower seeds into a bucket of glue with a little bit of water. Just, with, it'll dry clear, just saying, that's my advice. Um, material, yeah, I did that with sand and surprisingly, like, it was a crazy hold. Like, I thought, like, I was like, oh, for sure, this sand is going to start, like, wearing away, almost like glitter. And that is, like, it's not, it's not, it's not going anywhere. Like, <laughs> So that's what I would recommend in a little mixing bowl. Um, but yeah, same materials. I I love tactility and I, and I love like the kind of the history of materials, right? Like the personal, like the personal experience with materials and how that kind of shifts from person to person. Um, like there'll be like a pattern. I remember I made a, one of the first pieces I made when I started kind of being interested in objects was a, a couch. And it was a super basic, uh, basic, it was a couch I found online. I actually typed into Google grandmother's couch and I swear a couch that looked just like my grandmother's came up, thought it was hilarious. And um, I printed it out the size of a real couch. And um, 
I was, I was processing or thinking about like what makes something tangible, real, valuable. Is it um, its functionality? Is it being able to say you own it? Is like, I have this, it's mine. Um, and thinking like, if I print it, can I have it? It's the same size, the same uh, feel. But uh, right now I feel like my, I'm always thinking that my work is about um, the communities I engage with because I'm collecting from them and archiving. But I think, I think the more I think about my work and the more I make, I realize it's a lot about me. <laughs> like many artists and um, so much about processing my own identity. And I think Nicole touched on it a little bit earlier, but, and, and so did Emmanuel. I mean, we all have like just how vast the Latinx identity is, right? And it's like, what does it mean to be Latinx with, with, with uh, our history kind of coming from so many parts of the world, right? And, and being this kind of like um, conglomerate of all these things. And then, but also like, these indigenous roots right so I think I'm I'm also trying to process that like how my identity kind of uh shifts based on the spaces I occupy or the people I interact with uh, my relationship to those things um but how it's also what I consider it to be so I think it's yeah it's something I'll probably be processing forever <laughs> oh, that was beautiful oh. um I think similarly to, to what you were saying though, um, I think for me, I process like now, I think before I was like avoiding it, but I think now with my art, I process like, it's sort of like therapy. So it's therapeutic. So I, I think that before I was like a person who like really didn't like to talk about like anything personal. And I think like the past two years and, and some, some change, I've been, go it's like been very transitional for me. And just like you said, right, like many artists, we kind of think like, oh, we're, we're we are touching on a lot of different things, right? And we are kind of like diving into a lot of different planes and we're connecting to other people, but we're doing that through ourselves. And through the work, I feel like I'm finding some sort of like comfort and solace and therapy. I'm also like within the works that I did for the show, I'm touching on like this sort of traditional familiar kind of like trope of like loneliness that like my mother has gone through like my grandmother has gone through my aunts have gone through which is like this fear of being alone and not having like quote unquote a partner right like I think that in the, like the Latinx sort of community sometimes and like in the old kind of traditional way sometimes it's frowned upon right to not have like a, a significant other um, and to sort of just be an individual, right? Apart from them. Um, and then there's also just like a lot of fear, right? A lot of fear of like, what am I gonna do if I'm alone? What am I gonna do by myself? What is my future gonna look like? That's kind of like one of the things that I'm processing and sort of dealing with. And it's like, what does that mean to me? What does that mean through the lens of my mother or like the lens of my aunt? Like, how can I connect with them? How can I help? How can I understand, right? Cause it's also like a lot about understanding and not kind of like, I think a lot of times like you, you sort of start to, to build like your own canon based on these things and you sort of start to like get like judgmental or like you sort of start to like try to have um, an identity separate from. And a lot of times like the identity is sort of like woven within. I feel like I relate a lot to everything you said in a lot of ways or kind of processing similar things to a few of you. I feel like lately, especially I've been processing just things that have been in transition for a really long time, um, including just, I've been just processing a lot of things that change very rapidly under capitalism, but especially how these things have affected me and my lineage for so many generations, but also thinking about like a very repetitive history, like my mother um, being a single mother and my grandma also being a single mother and both of them being like cheated on, you know, by men and then being left to just fend for themselves while they have children. And I think that I've just been processing a sense of like independence that I, I feel like a lot of 
um, femmes and women have been thrown into in my work and outside of that, it's just something I process day to day um, as I also process survival and things that require survival and forms of sustainability um, through imagery, you know, and familiar um, imagery um, and things that do make me feel grounded in what I know to be true, um, but it has also sustained me. Um, so thinking a lot about access as well. Um, Blapanos being something that wasn't super accessible when I moved here. Um, and I grew up, once I left Puerto Rico, I grew up in Virginia and my relationship to food has just drastically changed, but especially how I saw myself. And I always feel like, at least when I process things, I always think about not loneliness, but I feel about, I feel a sense of like, oh, I need to do this, or I have to only have one figure present because internally and I feel like all of these things like need to be processed or done by themselves or highlighted individually I feel like it allows for a space to think about like self-worth and the power of just an individual or like you know just singularity is as just a, as a as a tool um I just think that there's just a lot of power in um, singularity and being alone and getting through it. But I do think that a lot of it has depended on community and on the ways that all of these things are visible and yet invisible. There's just, there's a lot of overlaps with how I think I think about um, material, but especially in how we, I guess, see ourselves and constantly look back at community to not carry us, but to help us out. And I, yeah, I've just been processing that. This goes right into my next question because I think all of us in our young age right now, when we're like moving out of the home that we grew up in or, you know, we have an apartment or we have roommates or all of those things or we're going to college I think in those moments like thinking of like what does home mean to me because you know I was living in you know with my mom or with my grandmother or with my guardian um and and that was like more of like their space right and it was your home too but now it's the transition of okay I'm setting up my own space what does that look like what how do I want it to feel what do I want to cook in the morning <laughs> like you know um how do I want my bed to feel like what colors do I want you know what kind of energy do I want in in my space so my question is what does home mean to you how are you defining it for yourself and if you want you could speak about how you're touching on the themes of home within your work like what are the messages there this is interesting um yes like who am I outside of this space right when I leave a space and enter a new space who do I become who do I want to be in that space what do I want this space to be to me is a really I think interesting thing that you I think when I um it's funny I mean like when I first so I'm from the Bronx born and raised um and I think when I first like left the Bronx, I was just like, oh my God, like what is my art gonna look like when I'm not here in the place that I know and I'm so familiar with that inspires my work so much, right? Like what, what will I make? And I think similarly when I went to residencies um, and now I just moved again to Connecticut and I was, I was kind of, I think it's always like a fear, like how will I um, stay in touch with the things that make me feel like me? Uh, and it was, it was crazy. I like uh, those things, I think never leave you, but there's always that fear. So we was driving here yesterday. I moved my studio. <sighs> I'm here. I have to unpack and it is crazy. A little preview. Um, but on the way here, I saw like the water and instantly I was attracted to it. And then like slightly after I just saw a bunch of food trucks. And then I saw like a bunch of Puerto Rican, Mexican flags. I'm Puerto Rican and Mexican. I got so amped and it just like called me. <laughs> I went over there yesterday after the move. I was like, I need to pick me up. 
and got the best um, birria tacos a girl could ask for. Um, and it was amazing. And it's just like, I think you find the things um, that you identify with and home, home is where the heart is, right? There's like that saying, which is like, I've noticed, you know, I was like, ah, oh, for example, like being at home, it's like, ah, oh, be nice to have my own space. My parents this, my parents that. But then it's like, you leave home and I'm like, hey mom, how are you? I'm like, <laughs> I had a hard day. I'm like, <laughs> you know? And I think it's, well, she's home for me. So it's like, you know, and getting those comfort foods, right? That's like, brings that sense of home. Um, and it's in my work too, you know? when a bottle of Vicks shows up or um, something that kind of reminds me, has carries that memory of like importance um, of cariño, right? Like that's the word. Oh, that was so sweet. You got me over here crying. <laughs> Stop. Um, I like, I definitely relate when you say like, you know, kind of home is what you make it, right? Um, when I was growing up, uh, so I'm also from the Bronx, right? Um, and I grew up in a one bedroom apartment with five other people, right? Um, we grew up really poor and I did not appreciate or enjoy my home, right? School was my home, right? So like literally I would spend hours in school. So I would wake up super, super early. I would go to school and have breakfast at school. I would stay there all day have my classes and then like I was like just trying to like help like trying to stay at school so like if a teacher needed something like the bulletin board right to be fixed or like papers to be graded um, once I got into high school I was literally like trying to just be involved in everything not only like did I grow up in like a really crowded home but like there was domestic abuse going on I just didn't want to be there um, and I remember like feeling like like I didn't have a safe place to go to other than school. So I think I do relate to like, you know, you kind of make your home, right? It doesn't, it doesn't always have to be like um, where you rest, like where you have a bed, right? Um, it's where you feel most comfortable, right? It's with the people that you love. It's with who you like enjoy to spend time with, or even if you just like to be by yourself. I think now that I'm older, right? Like I have my own space and I find a lot of like comfort with, you know, kind of just like enjoying my personal space. Um, and, and that obviously feels like home to me. But I think growing up, like I do kind of accredit a lot of it to like, just like those people that were there for me. So like even looking at homes through like other people, um, not just like it being a structure. Uh, so yeah, and within my work, I think that, um, you know, like, like I just said, like, looking at it through people, my mom always felt like home to me, right? Um, I did grow up with a single mom. Um, and I do have obviously like, a, I have siblings. Um, but I think like my mom was just like a, a prominent person in my life. And I, you know, like, I just always found like, comfort and guidance through her and there was times where we were like separated but like whenever we would kind of come back it always just felt like you know this is the person that um provides me peace this is the person that like you know gives me tranquility so I think that yeah for me home is is through my mom which I also try to like depict within my works um she definitely comes up a lot um as a theme you making me miss my mom <laughs> Ma, you guys, you know, take, where you at? I'm gonna take the train uptown right now. <laughs> Phone the mom. Stop playing. She's about to, she's Phone the mom. About to pull up. She's about to pull up I'm to your place. I'm listening to you guys. You guys are awesome. <laughs> I'm sending mom hugs to everybody. Mom hug. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so the question is like, what does home mean to you? Uh, home means to me, I, I guess really, um, any place could be home. I know that sounds kind of a little cliche, but for my, me growing up in like DC, I think like home could be like anywhere, you know, you go to your friend's house down the street, that's home. You know what I'm saying? Um, you at your actually at your actual home, that's home. Um, and I think home is just where you make it and where you feel comfortable. You know what I'm saying? Especially like if you have like in DC, 
we kind of have like a specific culture. So if you find people that share kind of your culture, that kind of speak your dialect, uh, those people could be considered a home because you feel comfortable there. Um, I kind of had a hard time too, leaving like DC, coming to New York and kind of making new friends. Cause you know, I had to make a new home. You know, I, I hear you guys always say it, like everybody's saying like, oh, I'm from the Bronx. I've actually only been to the Bronx probably like twice. I think I was telling you this, uh, Kiara. I was like, I've only been, I think I've only been to the Bronx twice, but when I went- Can we there, get him on the I train? We gotta get him on the train. <laughs> <laughs> we better put you on the train right now. <laughs> but when I went there, I went to uh, this party and it was like a, um, it was like a, I think it was like a, it was somebody's birthday. And I think they were like Puerto Rican. And when I went there, I felt like I was home. They was just walking me in. Here's some food, you know what I'm saying? Here's this, here's that. And I was just like, yeah, I would like to come back here because everybody here is so nice. Like, and I, they made sure I was fed. That's why I was like, that's nice, you know? Um, but yeah, even that sense, I think any place where people treat you nice and make you feel welcome, that's home. Um, I guess I would say home really is like such a complicated, like I have such a complicated relationship to it, having moved so much as a kid. Um, so honestly, I feel like home was like something that was com constantly mobile and like was just like, became a mobilized thing through um, what brought me comfort during times of like um, displacement um, that I had to face. And I think that I built a different relationship to home and I definitely saw home in my mom and my grandma and, you know, the apartment that we could afford. The school counselor, I kind of loved her. She was home. Um, <laughs> um, what else? The park really was home. I was always at the park. Yeah, there's so many things that can be considered home, you know. I have one last question for y'all and the question is what are y'all cooking up meaning what are you working on or it doesn't even have to be like oh you're working on like a physical work it could even be like what intentions are you setting for yourself right now yeah like what's um what are you cooking up in the studio or like what are some intentions that you're setting for yourself right now i uh so i just got this new studio i'm also starting school so it, it's definitely something that's on my mind um like what's next what's next for the work um i've been you know Emmanuel was talking a little bit about materials earlier and i think I, i'm definitely interested in finding like um more ways to get more familiar with materials and, and like assembling them is one important thing because it's when you work with so many materials right you don't want you don't want your work falling apart right it's like <laughs> you want your work to be secure and um sometimes when you when you don't have a plan which is my case all the time it's like um it's additive and so it's like for example it's like okay i want to add this piece of wood how do i add wood to canvas right or like how do i add vice versa how do i add sunflower seeds right to a panel or to canvas um so i think I'm, I'm definitely thinking about more ways to be more practical in my work um to, to try and not be so sporadic but still keep the exploration and keep that excitement but be a little more um strategic in that sense so, so trying to be more like balanced in that way where like, um, I think my, my Sagittarian moon is just like, let's have fun. And my Virgo is like, girl, scale it back. <laughs> you need a plan. Um, so that's, that's one way. And, and also trying to be a little more knowledgeable about the materials and where the history of those materials. Um, Cause again, it's normally just aesthetic attraction normally, you know, and obviously my own connection to them. But now thinking about what is this universal historical context of, of textiles, for example, right? And the, the relationship to femininity and their relationship to labor. And um, when it comes to fabric in particular, those weren't things I was thinking about. Uh, I was thinking like, you know, street culture. And again, like all kind of from my lens, but being able to um, 
also take in things that are outside of my out of my world right and like really be able to process that and, and make the decision about how I want to reference a material um, and how that might be communicated or be perceived uh, just to piggyback off of her um currently too I'm exploring uh like I said the new materials like the dog food uh, still trying to push the 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 way I can like um make the works look more visually appealing with like different kind of uh, wood like for the piece in the show I somebody threw away an old chair out of my studio and I literally broke it down with a hammer and put it in the work um so kind of like you know um uh, like I mentioned earlier following the long lineage of like assemblage art from like artists like Thor and Dial uh from like South just to name one uh who you know a lot of artists didn't have those kind of materials and um like proper materials and they still wanted to create art so they went out in the world and used stuff that was around them so I think a lot of Latinx artists too, like we do a samlage because it's kind of the ideology of turning nothing into something. You know, that's the beautiful thing about like our culture is like, you know, if you don't have one thing, you gonna find three things to make what you really need. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and even too, like I kind of think about like uh, objects like the cotton gin that was created, you know, to separate the seeds from the cotton, like how the slaves would find these different objects to make this machine to make their work easier. You know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, and you know, she was talking about the relationship to the materials and, I, and me seeing the sunflower seeds and putting it in my experience, somebody else might see it and have a different experience and kind of like connecting, bridging that concept because we all like Latinx, but we all have different experiences within our own individual cultures. Yeah, I've been cooking a lot of drawings, um, I guess. Like, I've been in the process of moving lately, but I've also just been thinking about how constraining, I guess, painting as a material has been for me, um, especially with a lot of um, the ideas that I'm working with. I feel kind of like I can't, it feels really restraining. And so I've been doing a lot of drawing work that, or I guess drawing before painting, but then also trying to like, jump back into sculpture because I actually went to school and studied sculpture, studied sculpture, I don't know. but it still feels like a part of my process or my practice that I feel like I had to let go for like sustainability purposes. And I think that lately I want to jump back into um, expanding work and having the sculptural work existing with the paintings. Um, and then and I'm moving into the studio on the first, so I'm finally going to have enough space for that and so that's been pretty exciting um and yeah I'm yeah cooking up some sculpture work <laughs> so I think that for me um I am I'm back in school so I'm doing my my um I'm, I'm a grad student and I recently got a grant like an art grant and I think it's just about me creating more work I think it's getting out of my own head um, I think at times I'm so anxious and I worry about like what I'm like what I'm doing technical kind of like within the technical field right sometimes I'm just like you know does this look good versus like am I conveying something that's meaningful which is what I should be worried about more so I get into like my own head about these things and I think it's kind of just like um, releasing that fear and just putting more work out there, right? So it's like, you know, I can have like this, this educational background when it comes to art, but like, how is that, how is it meaningful if not, if I'm not putting it into practice, right? So I think kind of just doing that and that's literally all I'm going to worry about. So if y'all see me not doing work, hold me accountable. That's it. Don't, Don't say worry. that now. <laughs> Don't worry. I got you, Nicole. <laughs> so we're going to open it up to Q&A. Is there anyone that would like to ask a question? We're going to be on for maybe like another 10 minutes just to give time for the Q&A. We, we have a question from Ruben for Cielo. They ask, can you talk about your relationship to color and to food? I also want to um, pinpoint 
that even when your work was up in the gallery, there were so many people looking at your work talking about your use of color because it's very like well put together you have a certain palette and I don't know what you do to mix that paint so that it like, <laughs> it, like you have it, it's like you put like a filter on the color yeah it's just like a really unique use of color so yeah can you talk about your relationship to color and to food yeah oh my god thank you <laughs> thank you so much um yeah I feel like part of it occurs through like just layering and like oil paint is something that requires like a ton of time and sometimes I just don't have time sometimes it's really about like it's I don't know they take different sittings I guess I would call them because I, I spend a lot of time just painting and it's literally all I do and my relationship to color has developed through living in Puerto Rico and then moving here and architecture and I'm just really inspired by um, the houses that I grew up in and just how like luminescent a lot of the houses I grew up in were. I almost feel like I developed like a sense of like not shame but I always questioned why my elders would choose these colors like it would be like these like greens and oranges that like just combining them would make me cringe a little bit but growing up and like I guess being away from home so long I feel like I began to miss it I began to like question modernity and what modernity is doing to color and how things become have become more neutral and what neutral means so I've kind of made it a goal to like remove certain colors from a from a composition and started using less white um because I think even with how color has been taught throughout school I think that we like I, at least for me I've kind of drifted away from not appreciating even like I don't know colors that weren't really taught you know or weren't really utilized but I also just think a lot about old photographs and because a lot of the photographs that I've been given have been passed down from my abuela and I still have a lot of them um, I kind of tricked them not really tricked them but I was like I'm gonna go scan them I'm gonna have them you know I'll give, I'll give them back and I end up scanning them and then just having them in my studio as a reminder of their presence um, in my space but also like there's a, a specific tint to photographs after their age you know and I think lately I've been really inspired by something that's aging and even things that had luminosity no longer have that luminosity. And I think a lot about the ways that those even mute, mute, mutedness can still have or contain that same sense of like, like boom, pow, you know, and still have a sense of comfort. And I don't like the associations that I think are often associated with like tropical culture or the ways that we think and shrink um, how we talk about Caribbean cultures and it seems so simplified sometimes when we think about color like oh it's bright or oh it's tropical it's like no a lot of the times it's like that's not it feels very simplified or it feels flattened almost at times and I guess that's just me but I, I just know that there's so much that color brings up that needs to be analyzed as well rather than just what warms it reminds like a toy or like a you know, a tourist perspective, for example. Definitely memory too. It's very intuitive. Like it's an intuitive process, just like cooking, you know? And I see those things as like, a par there's a parallel with cooking and, you know, painting because we're over here mixing paint for hours. And it's like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I'm like, at this point, I'm guessing, you know, like the whole thing, I'm just guessing. And it feels really a beautiful process of just not taking it seriously but also like following your intuition that's so true and like when a work like needs a little salt it's like you know what it needs that yeah. little line it needs that little diagonal the composition is a you know that's so true and just like knowing that intuitively right like your painting is missing uh I had a teacher that always say like you're just missing like a little bit of red and it just like became a joke like we're like just put red in it I love it just do um, it yeah <laughs> but yeah that that little thing um, I love how we're talking about color, I guess color as language, right? And like what is communicated 
through just that one part of a piece. I just want to say thank y'all for for holding space with me and for being a part of the show and for all these words that y'all shared. I think it's going to do a lot for everyone listening. And yeah, thank y'all for being present here today on a Monday night. Thank you, Kiara. Always appreciate your shows, the community and the vibes you bring. It's honestly a pleasure, uh, an honor to be part of the show. And thank you to all the other artists too. Thank you. Likewise. Such an honor to work with everyone. Thank you. Take care, people. Take care. Bye, everyone. Be safe. Bye. Get some food, y'all. Bag. Somebody heat up something. I need to take this bacalao out my teeth. (laughs) (laughs) Ship me some. Ship me some of that bacalao. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.